we would move on to our first first torchbearers of equity session for the evening. The title of the talk is Justice in Healthcare. We would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Vinod Shah. We also invite Dr. Suranjan Bhattacharji to moderate this session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen and organizers of this conference, it's a huge honor for me to introduce Vinod. Uh, Vinod was born just two months after we became an independent nation. So he's like many of us here. He's been born into hope and dreams uh, that our tomorrows will be better than our yesterdays were. His passion has been serving God through medical mission. And currently, he's a senior surgeon at St. Thomas Hospital and Leprosy Center, Chetpet. Now, to go back a little, he had a brilliant academic career. He did his MBBS, MS, and MCH pediatric surgery in CMC Velo and has extensive work experience. You know, his uh, describing him in five minutes is like trying to describe India or Europe in five minutes. It's, it's so varied and so full of excitement and um, diversity. So he was a pioneer missionary with the Indian evangelical mission amongst the Bhil tribe, where his wife Shalini and he developed the Jeevan Jyoti Hospital and worked there for 12 years. For the next 15 years, he developed the healthcare leadership for rural India by taking on the responsibility of being the CEO of the Emmanuel Hospital Association in New Delhi, India. This is an association of 21 hospitals and 29 health projects. Then for the next six years, he was here in CMC, uh, teaching and training family physicians using blended learning and multimedia. He trained more than 2000 family physicians, including government doctors, and uh, was head of the distance education and e-learning units at CMC. From 2011 and to 2019, for the next eight years, he was CEO of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, an association of Christian Medical Fellowship of 80 countries developing in leadership for healthcare worldwide. And interestingly, he chose to do that work from Velour itself. He said, if you really want to work among the poor, you have to live among the poor as well. He refused to go and, and do this work from one of the developed countries. For the last five years, he's been creating new models for providing affordable healthcare that's home-based comprehensive care in partnership with family physicians, physician assistants, and charity hospitals. This is being piloted in the Scudder Memorial Hospital. So to summarize, uh, following his brilliant academic record, uh, Vinod reminds me of somebody else from Gujarat, because he also comes from Gujarat. Uh, somebody else who had his professional education outside uh, his state, and then went on to uh, redefine what human relations could be like and how we can all uh, pursue a, a dream that is bigger than any one of us. So that The person I'm referring to is, of course, Mahatma Gandhi. So like him, uh, Vinod is, is amazing. Uh, his vision uh, was not only to, to serve God in a temple or in a church, but to serve God through his work, through his life among people. His integrity and his kindness are phenomenal. Uh, I know this personally because uh, in some small ways, I was a registrar when he was a postgraduate student uh, uh, doing his MCH. And Sudipta Sen, my uh, good friend, has told me many, many stories about the wonderful things that he has done and the wonderful discussions they've had. So here's a person who's willing to walk the talk, who's willing who has been willing not only to theorize about how uh, we can address the inequities in, in the health situation in our country, but has actually done amazing things about it. So it's an honor to, to introduce you, Vinod, and I'm looking forward to hearing your talk. And thank you very much for agreeing to address this gathering. Uh, thank you, Suranjan. Um, I've not always had so much luck with uh, introductions. 
once uh, when I was in North India, I was uh, speaking to a rural congregation and the leader came up and said, uh, I want to introduce you. So I want to know what kind of a doctor are you? So I said, I'm a pediatric surgeon. So he went up and he said, this is Dr. Vinod Shah. He's a childish surgeon. Um, what I want to do now is uh, to reduce some of the stuff I already have on my, pie part, on my PowerPoint because uh, there is a lot of repetition. And then uh, maybe at the end of the presentation, just tell you something about what I have learned, maybe just in a few minutes, over the years of the work that I have put in. <clears throat> Uh, the summary of what I want to tell you today is uh, the iniquity that exists. You probably know that quite well in India and globally. And then what you might not know is this, the pernicious impact of these iniquities. You'll be really surprised. And then um, causes, you already know a lot about social determinants of health, uh, but I might just touch about talk to you about the political determinants and if there is time some commercial determinants very briefly and then uh, I'll talk to you about some theories of distributive justice uh, yesterday Rehana talked about a lot of these um, I might skip that and just talk to you about what I think is the right approach to justice and then uh, finally what we can do in the global and the local environment and it is interesting that what we can do in Africa and India is almost so similar. <clears throat> Iniquity is a problem. Um, and India is among the most unequal countries in the world with rising poverty and an affluent elite. You probably know this well. Uh, if it is a problem, whose problem is it? Um, just to give some metrics about the problem, uh, 60 million people go below the poverty line each year. Um, this has gone up now. I just read the statistic today. Um, you can see the out-of-pocket expenditure in percentages. Uh, it ranges from 33 to 71, but I believe it has gone up to 75. That means for every 100 rupees you spend, 70 rupees comes out of your pocket. Um, and of course, 60 million people go below poverty line each year. After a year or two, they come up again. But as they come up, another 60 million will go below the poverty line. So there is a seesaw of 60 million people going up and down below the poverty line. <clears throat> and uh, these are some figures about the disparity Lesotho, you know, is a landlocked country in Africa, 15 years, life expectancy, 84 in Japan. But I want you to look at the maternal mortality rate, 462 in the developing countries versus 12. So that is a really a massive disparity. Um, <clears throat> and then again, sorry, physician access, uh, low-income countries, Physician Act, there are only 0.5 physicians per thousand. In most of most of India, this is about one, but in Tamil Nadu, it has now gone up to three. So you can imagine how Tamil Nadu's number of physicians per thousand is almost equal to the number of physicians in Sweden. <clears throat> uh, one percent of the world owns 46 percent of the wealth and one percent of the wealth is owned by 55 percent of the population this is again disparity uh, i'm talking to you about wealth because wealth is health and health is wealth uh, it shouldn't be but it is now in in india uh, the scheduled caste scheduled caste population there infant mortality rates and under five mortality rates are vastly different from the others. Uh, I was telling you about wealth is health. Again, huge disparity in India. Uh, it's 
US is also one of the most unequal countries in the world. The three more very unequal countries, South Africa first, because it had a double whammy, apartheid and colonialism, and then US and India. <clears throat> and you can see the disparity there between the black, white, and the Hispanic populations. Uh, poverty was going down, but then after the COVID epidemic, it's gone up again <clears throat> in India. Now, this is an interesting graph I want you to see. Um, 1960 was the time when colonialism was sort of over. And you can see the disparity between the developed countries and the developing countries. And now, after 50 years or 55 years, the disparity is greatly increased. Now, uh, economists call this the economic colonization, which is actually much worse than the geographic colonization. <clears throat> and I will come to that when I come to the political determinants of health. Now, I, I'm, uh, I'm very keen that you read uh, some of these books, and I will tell you which one specially. Uh, there are three books I'm recommending. One is called The Broken Ladder. Here, it talks about how people at the bottom can never come up, and because of some reasons, and uh, how it has got consequences for all, and this is an important part of what I'm going to say. Unequal democracy talks about uh, the similar thing, but it talks about different kinds of impact. It talks about political po polarization, reduce government responsiveness, decrease social mobility. That means you cannot come up uh, in societies which have inequity. But the book that I would really like you to read is this, which is really a bestseller, 150,000 copies, 23 languages. It's called The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone. Now, uh, he has used the word equality not in a justice sense. You know, he's inter using the word equality and equity interchangeably. But this book, and I'm going to show you a lot of the studies from this book. They are research-based studies, and people could not believe it. And so there was research done on his research, and there was research done uh, to, to make sure that his research was really uh, valid. And so, and it has been proved that it is absolutely valid. And now this book provides hard evidence to show how almost everything from life expectancy to mental illness, from violence, illiteracy, is affected not by how wealthy a society, but how equal it is. <clears throat> now, all these, you know, from mental health to child uh, well-being, from teenage to education, to drug abuse, to obesity and social mobility, all are affected because of inequity. But the interesting part is this, that it affects the well-to-do also equally. Now, that is the shattering part. And that is what should wake us up, because we are all above the poverty line. And this inequity can affect us. It can affect our children, can affect our grandchildren. And this is what the Time magazine has to say. Um, children having children is calm, uh, in unequal societies. Uh, troubled kids, people who are troubled, who drop out, uh, people who do crime, go to jail, in spite of the fact they come from well-to-do families, people who take to violence and shoot, you know, every week there is a shooting in the U.S., and that is connected, according to some researchers, to the disparity and inequity in the country. Um, <clears throat> and uh, social... Uh, uh, um, mis malbehavior is also connected to punish is an effect of inequality. Now, this is a quotation from Lancet. It is now well established that the more unequal the society, the worse the outcomes for all, including those at the top. Uh, health, now this is the study. Uh, who, health and social problems are worse in more unequal countries starting from, you know, the U.S. is top of the list, even though it is a rich country. Levels of trust are higher in more equal countries. Norway and Sweden are very equal. Prevalence of mental illness 
is higher in more unequal rich countries. US has the highest number of psychiatrists and is very rich, but in spite of that, mental illness is extremely high because of inequity. <clears throat> Drug use is more common in more unequal countries, again, US at the top. Life expectancy is longer in more equal rich countries. Japan is right at the top. Infant mortality rates are higher in more unequal countries. Again, uh, the US. More adults are obese in more unequal rich countries. Again, the US. Educational scores are higher in more equal rich countries. Finland is uh, scores high because it's very equal. Teenage birth rates are higher in more unequal rich countries. Again, in the US, where contraceptives are available in large numbers. Homicide rates are higher in more unequal rich countries. Again, the US. Children experience a more con uh, children experience more conflict in more unequal societies. Now. You might see the India is not here on the list. That's partly because India was not studied. Otherwise, you might find India quite next to the US. Rates of imprisonments are higher, again, US. Now, uh, this is just to let you know how inequity affects all spheres of life. Not, it's not simply about health. It's about everything. And anyway, everything is connected to everything, uh, wealth, uh, teenage pregnancy, everything is connected to health, so we need to take notice. And it affects not only the poor, it affects the well-to-do equally. Now, that is really the problem. <clears throat> um, and then I wanted to talk to you about theories of distributive justice, egalitarianism, which is equal input. Equal input will produce unequal output, so that will not help. Utilitarianism, greatest good for the most number of people but that will cut off the poor because most means people who are right at the top. Libertarianism means leaving it to the market forces. If you leave it to the market forces like it is being left in India, leaving it to the private sector, leaving it to the corporates, again, will uh, marginalize the poor. So there, are, there is, but there is John Rawls fairness principle where it says inequality in distribution is fine if it can help people at the bottom. <clears throat> that means inequality in distribution is fine. That means rich can pay more taxes so that there is equity. But the rich needs to understand that in the end, they will be benefited more than anybody else. And I will explain that to you. Uh, this is uh, the book that is uh, supposed to be a classic. Of course, I've not read it. I've read some summaries of it, uh, but it was uh, it's uh, being quoted by the most number of people. He says inequality is fine if it helps the poor. Inequal input is fine because it will produce equity. <clears throat> uh, you know this diagram quite well. It was shown several times yesterday. Uh, what is equity and what is equality? Uh, in the Bible, there is a jubilee principle, an interesting principle, where the slaves were released and the forgiveness of debt were forgiven and property was repatriated, land was given back in the jubilee year. Now, this was done so that to prevent extreme inequity. So, a society that does not have extreme inequity will prosper. And this is the reason why we have this, they had these principles in the, in the Old Testament. <clears throat> uh, inequity, what does it do to nations? You know, uh, if you look at the cause of all these French Revolution, Communist Revolution, Civil Rights Movement, the Arab Spring, all these things had their origin in inequity. <clears throat> uh, now, I was telling you about how it is beneficial for all. Equity is beneficial for all. And inequity is bad for all. Now, let's say the government subsidizes free education for the poor and free health for the poor. The government has to get the money from taxes. And obviously, the rich will have to pay more taxes. So let's imagine the rich are willing to pay more taxes. 
And so the government is able to subsidize education for the poor, education and health for the poor. And then that produces empowerment of poor. They become educated, they become healthy, and then they get jobs. And then they start small businesses, small enterprises. And that expands the economy. And when the economy expands, who do you think will benefit the most? It'll be the people who are rich because they have an expanded economy. They already have business in place. And so they will, uh, they will actually earn far more than what they have actually put in. And they will also be able to employ the newly trained human resource. They will be human resource available for their new businesses. So this is a win-win for all. And it is this understanding that needs to uh, go down so that people uh, are happy to pay taxes. I don't know whether that will ever happen. <clears throat> um, I was telling you about causes of inequity. Um, we all know about social determinants, but I want to talk to you about global political determinants. I want to talk to you about this because I want us to be a little less harsh, harsh on our governments even if they try very hard, they will find it extremely difficult to subsidize health. And I will tell you why. Uh, there's a definition from Lancet about political determinants of health. Now, uh, these are these five global factors that will that is hampering health and that will continue to hamper health as long as this world order exists. The first is the arms the sale of arms to the poor countries by the developed countries. Now that runs in billions and billions of dollars. And then the corruption, uh, as long as there is corruption, people in developing countries will put their money in offshore banks, tax-free havens, which all belong to the developed countries. <clears throat> and then the debt, the we have so much debt, so many countries have so much debt, that servicing the debt itself is a huge source of income for the developing countries. And then, of course, you have refugees uh, all over the place. There are so many wars going on. And then there is the climate change. And so all these five factors will prevent government from ever having enough money to invest in health. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure you know enough about climate change, how it affects health, almost every aspect of health. And now this is about structural adjustment. Yesterday, the, one of the, the person I was uh, chairing, he talked about structural adjustment, and I just want to dilate on this a little bit. <clears throat> now, structural adjustment means when they give a loan, India has taken a lot of loan, African countries have taken a huge amounts of loan, and when they take a loan, you have to give them some guarantees. And the guarantee is you will do away with protectionism. That means you will allow anything to come into your market for sale. That means all sorts of perfumes can come in uh, that nobody really wants and they will be sold. And uh, you have to do away with welfare. You cannot use that money for education or health. And then you have to, you cannot give subsidies to farmers. You you heard about the farmer revolution in Punjab because they want to do away with subsidies. And you cannot give them minimum price guarantees if you take a loan. Um, and then you have to privatize and disinvest from any government undertaking. Uh, you cannot have price controls because you have to open up your market to market forces all over the world. And then the worst thing of all, is you have to pay in hard currency. Now, if you take a loan of, let's say, $1,000, you have to pay back in dollars. You cannot pay back in rupees. Now, if you have to pay back in dollars, what do you have to do? You have to get, you have to earn the dollars. And to earn the dollars, you have to sell some goods. And who do you have to sell it to? You have to sell it to people with hard currencies, which is only five or six countries. Euro, pound, uh, and the US dollar and maybe one or two other countries. You, so you have 130 countries, 160 countries trying to sell to these five countries and you can see how you'll get a very hard bargain and you hardly earn anything from 
selling and exporting, but you have to do it because you want the dollars to be able to service your debt. So uh, this is what has completely destroyed Africa and they have absolutely no money for, um, for investing in health. Uh, arms trade, 50, 60 billion dollars every year. And uh, this is what has happened to Africa. This presentation was done for an African audience. And so this is why I have this here. But uh, it is helpful for us to know. Um, what I want to know, what I want you to know is all this debt is more than 50% of the GDP. That means all that you earn in a year, half of it is to go off to service the debt. India's debt is 19% of the GDP, which is really not bad. Uh, but you can see some of the countries, uh, the loan crossed 100% of GDP. That means they are debt trapped. A uh, lot of countries in our neighborhood are debt trapped. Pakistan is debt trapped. Sri Lanka uh, and Bangladesh and very soon Nepal. So uh, these countries will never have enough money for health. And so you have to be a little kind to the government if they cannot invest enough. Uh, but maybe not India because India probably is now prospering and they have enough money. But the end result of all the structural adjustment and everything is this $5 trillion go from the developing countries to the developed countries each year and only $2 trillion come back to the developing countries through aid. You know, they are giving charity and through trade. So each year, $3 trillion, $3 trillion go away from the developing countries. And so the becoming wider and wider. And so the money that is going to be available for health is going to be less and less and less if you're debt trapped. <clears throat> Uh, social determinants of health, you know. I just also wanted to just talk about uh, activism or pursuit of justice and isolation. Now, uh, French Revolution happened because they wanted justice, justice and isolation. They just wanted, uh, you know, equal. And then uh, we know what happened. There was a bloodbath. The people who took over actually killed all the aristocrats and they killed the queen and the king. Uh, and then Robespierre, who was the head of the revolution, he himself was then killed and guillotined by another group. Uh, Communist Russia, the proletariat came into power. They wanted equality and then they killed all the bourgeois. And then they kept on killing and then about 5 million people were killed. Similar thing happened in China and Pol Pot and Cambodia. And uh, we have caste-based massacres in Bihar and UP. We know the story of Fulan Devi, how uh, she was raped and many of her people were killed, low caste, so-called. And then she killed a lot of the Bhumihars or the upper caste. And then the Bhumihars killed her when she was trying to go to the parliament. So it creates a cycle of <clears throat> uh, violence. So I'm saying that activism activates the victim, victimizes the cycle. You know, you empower the victim and then the victim will become the victimizer and the victimizer becomes a victim. And then the cycle will just keep going. The victim becomes a victimizer. And so uh, <clears throat> what is the solution? Uh, we have an interesting solution that was showcased by Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. South Africa, with apartheid, with colonialism, became independent in 1990, became democ a majority rule in 1995. The black people took control. Nelson Mandela's party came to power. And then you would have expected that all the black people would have killed all the white people, like it usually happens. But in this particular case, it did not happen because of these two people. One is Nelson Mandela, and the other is uh, Desmond Tutu. They created what is called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which talked to every, every uh, episode of massacre and got people to write it down so that the truth came out and then asked people to forgive 
and then ask the black people to accept that forgiveness. It was not 100% successful, but whatever, it, it, it was on the whole very successful because there was no bloodbath after that. And so uh, moral of the story is that you cannot have justice without mercy. When we talk about equity and justice, we should remember that uh, justice and mercy are two sides of the same coin. We cannot separate or dissect out one from the other. I have a quotation here. To forgive is not just to be altruistic. It is the best form of self-interest. Uh, you know, in Persia, the Merchant of Venice, the story you probably know quite well, <clears throat> quality of just, uh, mercy is not strained. What Shakespeare was trying to say, again, was the same thing. Mercy and justice cannot be separated. Uh, I gave you the example of South Africa and Desmond Tutu, and I told you about how they should not be dissected from each other. And a naked a pursuit of justice will often end up in violence. Um, now, I have a list of what we can do nationally and locally. Um, one is adv advocate increased funding for health. I think maybe India can uh, increase it from 2% to 4%. And then advocate an increase in primary care uh, versus tertiary care. India is spending more money on tertiary care and less money on primary care. It needs to be reversed. And then advocate for family medicine training, uh, advocate for alternative human resource for health or also called task shifting and use of digitization or technology. I will just dilate on that a little bit. Uh, and then some more community-based initiatives with vocational training and electronic schools. I'm just talking about schools because schooling is an integral part of health. If you don't do anything, if you don't have any health initiative, if you just have schools, it will transform health. Now, that is an important thing to understand. <clears throat> so you should not, I think we should not start health initiatives without some effort at schooling, because schooling is very foundational. And then cooperative village pharmacies, uh, generic, I will just talk about that, and home-based care. Health spending needs to go up. Other countries, African countries, uh, not spending enough. But you can see UK spends 10%. But if India can go up to 4%, that would be good. Uh, US is spending less on primary and more on tertiary. And Chile is spending more on primary and less on tertiary. Now you can see how it affects life expectancy. Chile is way up ahead, even though they spend uh, one ninth of what the US spends. Their life expectancy is way higher. And so it is a lesson for us that we need to also reverse our spending on tertiary and put it more on primary. Um, and this is there is a lot of proof available for all that. In spite of that, people are enamored by tertiary rather than primary. Uh, family physician, they need to stop referring and they need to resolve more. And if you Family medicine, family medicine is pro poor. I'm not going to go into it. If you if you want to know more, you can ask, you know, Chat GPT or something. Um, alternative human resource for health. Um, I think this is very important because every repetitive activity should be labeled and transferred to a health worker. Anything that is repetitive should be moved out of the scope of a doctor and moved on to the te technician. And that way, you will actually reduce healthcare costs. This includes uh, this includes um, nurse practitioners. I worked for 27 years in North India. Um, and I worked mostly with nurse practitioners. They were actually giving spinals. They were giving spinals better than doctors, and they were intubating. They were intubating better than the new anesthetists anyway. And so, uh, I mean, why should they not? I mean, they are also human beings. So uh, it is because of the repetitive nature of the work, they will, their skill will be more than the skill of a doctor. Because doctor, 
will be doing so many different skills, but here this person is doing one skill over and over again. So he will be not only better skill, so you not only have better quality, but you have lesser cost. Uh, this is a task shifting. There are other advantages. They take pride in their work. They don't migrate uh, to the US and so on too often. And uh, they are good. Their quality is good. And then community-based insurance. Now, community-based insurance is a failure because it will not sustain. But selective community-based insurance will work. Selective community insurance means just diseases, non-communicable diseases, say diabetes, hypertension, or antenatal care um, and under five care. So uh, <clears throat> those things will work. And so if the country doesn't have money, they can move into selective community-based insurance. And then when they have more money, maybe they can do other things. India has, we have so many health insurance schemes. Every state has got one. There is a central government one. It's a good scheme, but utilization is only 1.3%. Is that correct? People who know here, people. Um, and community-based health insurance should complement. It cannot be a standalone. And then I just want to talk about generic drugs. There are three kinds of drugs, branded, 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 generic, and generic, generic. And generic, generic drugs are very, very cheap. I think uh, you talked to us about it. Uh, and the problem about generic drugs, I don't know whether it's true or not, people are worried about quality. So if there is an NGO that can work on the quality and provide quality assurance, can we not have uh, generic pharmacies all over the countryside. <clears throat> uh, quality controlled assisted prime minister's people's pharmacy. And then uh, can we not create an ecosystem that gets paid for wellness and not for disease? The current system is more illness, more money for the, for the hospital, for the doctors. Now that does not, that is not really a good model because you get paid for illness. Now, suppose we had a system where you get paid for wellness, and if that is model, uh, owned by the insurance company, suppose insurance companies own hospitals, then what will happen is insurance companies will want to decrease hospitalization. And because they want to decrease hospitalization, they will have lots of workers. They will go into people's homes and say, you are too obese, you're not exercising, please, you have to do this. You haven't gone for a checkup, you have to do that and your blood sugars, you haven't got those done, you have to get it done. And so they'll push primary care in a huge way because they are really concerned about the money. And so that can be a model we don't have, but there are models in the US that are uh, based on the insurance owning hospitals. <clears throat> um, currently I'm training home-based care workers who can go to homes and do stuff I'm not going to talk about this because it's not quite a success and I'm struggling with it. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, equipment that they can use from home, tele-gadgets, uh, and I also have an uh, algorithm which is being connected to artificial intelligence so that an ordinary person can use the algorithm and make a diagnosis. Uh, it's not actually tested yet. Um, this is a list of what I want to do, what uh, what I've been telling you about. Uh, th these are some take-home measures, messages. Uh, inequity is very is a very inflammatory phenomenon. It affects everyone and every sphere of life, and affect also affects the folk at the top and the children. Some inequality should be suffered and is unavoidable if it helps reduce inequity. Though political determinants of health are massive, we can showcase several models of equitable health that can catch the imagination of the policy makers. We can easily get uh, discouraged looking at the political determinants of health, but what I think we should do is create good models that are success in, in a microcosm, in a taluk or something, and then showcase that, and then maybe the policymakers will look at that and then be interested in scaling it up. 
and then we should have a moral imperative in the pursuit of justice not justice alone but justice and mercy uh, i'll i will uh, close the presentation here but i just wanted to share with you some things that i have learned um, over the years working um, i can't tell you everything but i'll just tell you a few things <clears throat> It was in the year 1976 that Shalini and myself, we felt we should go and work in a needy area. And of course, there was no internet and there was no information. And nobody had, nobody knew what the census book looked like. And so we went to the government officers. Finally, they dusted out a census book in 1971. And then we looked at that. We had never heard of tribals or Adivasis. And then we, there we saw there were these tribal populations. And then we looked at where these tribal populations were <clears throat> and mapped out that. And then we found that there was a big tribal belt in the Gujarat, Rajasthan, Pakistan border. That tribal belt was called the Beel tribe. And because I knew Gujarati, um, so I thought maybe going there would be easier because I know some the language. And so Shalini and myself went there um, and there was a barber shop and uh, we got a small house and then started a clinic in the barber shop. So this is how we started. It was very difficult. There was no running water. There was no electricity. Uh, there was no gas. It was cooking on kerosene. And we had three children, and so there was no school. And so my wife was doing homeschooling. And so life was difficult. <clears throat> of course, there was no air conditioning, and it was so hot in the summer. Uh, but that was not really the issue. We got used to that after a while. But the real problem was inside. Uh, the problem was this. I used to feel, why is it that I have to come here? Uh, and why is it the others can go abroad and make money? Why do I have to be poor? And then I was jealous and I used to feel upset and angry. I used to throw, throw temper tantrums at home saying, I don't know why you agreed. You know, I was shifting blame on her. So why did you agree to come here? Didn't you know the practical difficulties? And then, so I was struggling for a long time. But I was, I came to some kind of uh, equilibrium while I was working there because that was beginning to be interesting. Uh, the Maharaja, there was a Maharaja there who was the, who was, who owned all the tribal land. And uh, I went up to him and I said, uh, your highness, <clears throat> can I have your harem? He had a harem with 300 women. So I said, uh, your highness, can I have the harem? So first thing you said was, do you want it with the women or without the women? So <laughs> um, anyway, the, he had chased off all the women. And uh, the long and short of it was after the initial reluctance, he sent, he sent the keys to me. And then I renovated that and started a hospital. And so you know, I was becoming interested. But every time we took leave from there, and came home to Kaimito, where my home was, and came to Bangalore, where the office was, the mission office, I used to look at the houses, and I used to look at the friends who had come back from abroad with bulging suitcases and with a lot of money, and I used to look at the professors, and I used to say, I'm just a stupid rural doctor working in tribal area with nothing at all. Uh, no money, no reputation, no academics, nothing. And so there was the serious problem inside. And for me, that was the most important part of what I learned. <clears throat> I learned uh, humility because um, what shall I say? I, I learned, I was absolutely self-centered and I learned compassion. I was um, very money-minded and I learned gratitude. And so some of the things
because I learned that were probably more important than the impact I made in the community. Thank you. On. Thanks. Thank you very much, Vinod. Um, you, know, you can see that my introduction was accurate. Um, it, it's a huge privilege for us to listen to Vinod. And um, I just want to um, try and moderate this section so that we can get as many questions in as possible. So I don't see any questions on my computer. So the, the uh, time is available now. For anyone on the floor who would ask, like to ask Vinod a question. I have a mic just in. Um, just for my understanding, uh, can we? Uh, you mentioned about activism without mercy can perpetuate the victim victimizer cycle. So, can we say, uh, is it okay to say? Uh, um, activism does it, or can we say extreme activism only does that? Yes. <clears throat> I, I think you're right. See, there is the short-term activism. You want to change everything overnight. That's a revolution. Revolution is uh, extreme activism. You're right. But the, the ability to change things slowly is definitely very important because what has happened in Tamil Nadu is the change happened over actually a hundred years. Periyar, I think he was born in 1916 or something. And so it has taken a long time so that there was no bloodshed here because it was a so slow and a gradual change. And even before that, there were so many schools in Tamil Nadu, which the missionaries had established, maybe more than four, 5,000 schools. And uh, there were more schools in Tamil Nadu than anywhere else in the country at that time. And so because of the education and because the process was slow, it was it was fine because it was imperceptible. The change was imperceptible. But if you want overnight change and if you start creating power structures to put people down, then I think it will create violence. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Parth. Uh, I have just one doubt, sir. Like, based on your experience, what would be your advice uh, for somebody like me who also dreams of uh, working in remote areas? Uh, yes, good, good question. <clears throat> one is to accept legitimate suffering. You know, uh, Freud said, Freud or was it, uh, what's his name? The other psychiatrist. Pardon? Jung. Yeah, Jung, yes, Jung. He said, um, neurosis is always a substitute for legitimate suffering. That means if you don't accept the legitimate suffering, now you want to go to some place to serve. Now, remember, when you do that, there will be legitimate suffering. There may not be friends. There may not be water. There may not be enough money to do the things that you used to do in a tertiary institution. And so you will undergo some suffering and you have to accept that and expect that. Because if you accept that, then it will lead to maturity. But if you don't, then it will produce neurosis. This is what Young says. Uh, sir, uh, I, I just one small question. What gives you hope uh, that inequity and uh, will reduce and justice might prevail um, in your you didn't mention about some models that you were uh, that you cited in your presentation but what is it that gives you hope that you that you seem to be still you know so involved with work yeah. and, uh, see in the 1970s I did not even know the meaning of equity uh, I didn't go to provide justice or to change anything very much. I just went because it was a sense of vocation. I did, I just wanted to work among the poor. That's about all. 
and I was not even thinking, I didn't, we were not even taught to think about impact. Uh, that sort of thinking came afterwards. We were just told to serve. And so that was what I did. But when I came into leadership positions, then I began to understand. And then what I have understood is that justice is a slow process. It cannot be done overnight. And then it is a process uh, which needs to be done in a way that the people who are empowered don't, uh, they look compact structures. Like uh, <clears throat> we have to teach them, for example, that yes, the, the high caste people are torturing you, but remember that they are also victims of their culture. You know, uh, you, you, we are all victims of our own culture. We all have our own bias. And the upper caste people have their own bias. And they are brought up to think like that. And therefore, they cannot think differently. So you need to understand that and be compassionate. So I think uh, that is an important principle. And the most important principle in empowerment is not health, really, but education. Thank you for your talk, sir. It was just one question I had about reservation in education. So, for example, now we have a reservation for UGs from so many uh, SCSTs and everything. And so we say that that empowers them. So they come in for, they come into MBBS and then once they pass out, then we say, oh, they're not yet empowered enough, even though technically an MBBS degree puts them on equal footing with any other doctor in the country. So we go ahead and add reservation into the MD program or the MS program saying that, you know, at the next level now, they'll definitely be empowered if they become postgraduates. And now at the end of it, you say that, oh, but they're still, you know, not empowered. So let's go ahead and add reservation into the MCH program and the DM programs. So, I mean, even in, on that's on a medical education scale, on the schooling scale, we have the fact that all this debate going on on whether the state syllabus should be the only entrance to medical college so that we facilitate, you know, Tamil Nadu students getting into medical education. And in one sense, that's alienating everyone else in India from the excellent education facilities we have in Tamil Nadu or vice versa. So what's your view on, I mean, uh, the sustainability of reservation? Like, is it a necessary evil in the temporary thing or is it achieving what it was set out to achieve in the long run? Because you mentioned education particularly as a... Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, I'm not really... Um studied this in great detail, but my gut feeling is this. Once a person is empowered, like uh, some people from the tribal community where we work, some of them actually become doctors and surgeons. Now, I think that they should be taught to give back. They should not be taught to again use their position to get more advantage because then they become, they have a dependent uh, culture of dependency. So, what they should be taught is once you have received something, learn to give it back and learn to serve others. So I would think that when one generation has been empowered, they should not have, you know, rights. But uh, I'm not really a scholar about, I, not, I don't know enough about this. So I refrain to give too much advice. <clears throat> One last question, if I may be permitted. This uh, uh, someone has sent it up, so I'm not sure who's asked this. Uh, you know, the question is, why did you say that the learning of compassion and gratitude is more important than the impact you have made? Because everyone works in that direction, and service is important. And CMC's motto is not to be served, but to serve. Um, <clears throat> I guess. Uh even if I had not gone, um, things would have changed. Um, somebody else would have gone. I'm not, uh, what shall we say, indispensable. Um, other people came after I came, went there. So, but uh, for me, the greatest benefit was the change in character and understanding, compassion, learning some humility and stuff like that. Um, yes, but yes, obviously, 
I'm very grateful that there has been a lot of impact because of the work that I had done. It's a uh, icing on the cake. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, one of my tasks is to try and summarize what we've learned. And so, you know, just listen to this and correct it if you think it needs correction. But I think the first thing we, he, Vinod emphasized is inequity is harmful. It's harmful for everyone, not just for some. And the second important factor that the point he wanted to make is health and wealth are very closely interrelated. And therefore, addressing inequity is beneficial not only for health, but for all aspects of life. Uh, the third thing he wanted to us to re remember is that there is enough for everyone's need, but not enough for even one person's greed. So learning how to uh, address our greed is an important uh, task that we have to undertake as individuals and as collectives if we are to address the problem of inequity. Uh, the last, I mean, some, uh, uh, some of the other things that I learned is he reminded us that the arc of the universe bends towards justice. Um, but of course, the arc of the universe is big and long. It's not instantaneous, but that is a hope that we all have. Uh, I'm trying to paraphrase Martin Luther King, but I, I believe that, that what he told us is true. Um, the other thing he reminded us is positive discrimination is not wrong. If a mother has four children and one is sick, then if she's very poor, she'll have to divert some of the legitimate, res uh, I mean, some of the resources for the legitimate needs of the other children to be able to address the child who is sick. And once, hopefully once the child is no longer sick, uh, uh, the resources can be used uh, more equitably with greater equity. But positive discrimination is not wrong. It's necessary to uh, solve some of the problems that we have in society. And ultimately, if, prob if uh, it results in greater equity, all of us are more healthy and all of us are helped. Uh, he also addressed uh, the issue of uh, the importance of compassion and humility. He reminded us that service is important, but when we serve, it tends to uh, make us arrogant uh, because we feel that we are the source of the of the correctives and uh, and that we are the only source of goodness and therefore it's very important not only to serve but to remember with compassion and humility that when we serve others actually we are serving ourselves because we are part of society and uh, this would be helpful and uh, most of all we know thank you for sharing your own experiences with our with us you are a true teacher because you have shared your own uh, learnings and I bow to you in reverence. Thank you. We would like to especially thank Dr. Vinod Shah for that inspiring talk and Dr. Suranjan for moderating the previous session.